Send it back to short here. That's crazy. Fair enough. It's been a while since I've been on, apparently. So <laughs> that's how it goes. Uh, well, thanks, Julie and Sean, uh, for letting me uh, talk today. So um, I'm going to be doing some work. Or Jeff and uh, Rebecca and I are going to propose to do some work um, for the community. Uh, and of course, the funding calls uh, you know, direct us to respect the community and all that. So we thought we'd just bring up these ideas first give the community a chance to, you know, provide some feedback or whatever before we move forward. Uh, and I've also brought up a couple other projects before that probably from Mel's perspective just disappeared off the map. So I thought I'd just take a couple minutes before going on to the new stuff just to let you know what happened to the old stuff just so it's, you know, hopefully a little bit less of a black hole. So let me see if I can share here. Okay, share screen. Okay, is that coming across Pro Project Potpourri? Sure is. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so yeah, as I said, it's gonna be some updates on some previous stuff and some proposals to come. Um, so there's a, a few ideas. So my project overview previously, I like had sent messages out onto the full Pisces list and all that uh, about a solar telescope plan um for the total eclipse in 2024 so i just you know gonna update on where that what happened there um there was also another thing that i put out on the list and then it goes um it was kind of like project hook so to see if we can get some different um, projects coupled together some more um and then um i just recently submitted something on PySat cdf so that i thought i talked about uh and then the project that um jeff rebecca and i are are, are starting about talking about <laughs> talking about starting up uh, is the orbit propagation uh project okay so the first one the solar telescope project um it was with the city of Frisco and some other groups, and I actually got pretty far into the city, uh, got like the city manager and all kinds of other people. One person I did not get was the director of Parks and Recreation. So just having fun because I like the show, I kind of feel like, you know, I got Ron Swanson. <laughs> so I got to Ron Swanson. He said no. Uh, and then so much for the telescope. Uh, there's obviously, you know, I could come up with a variety of reasons why they may not want some expensive telescope in a public park. But uh, that's okay. So I refracted the project. Obviously, I couldn't do the telescope, couldn't do the full group thing. So I just submitted on um, OMMBV, which is open source software that I have talked about before, like at the summer school. Um, so I was presented at the summer school. Uh, this software on calculates an orthogonal vector basis for multipole magnetic fields. So this is actually really significant for plasma science, electric field distributions, and things like that in our space environment. So you basically need it for anything that if you're studying plasma or electrodynamics. Um, it was also very surprising to me to find that the package also yields art directly from the science. So those images on the bottom that are hopefully coming across, those are actually performance plots for the software. Um, and uh, I just removed the title and the axis labels and the color bar. But otherwise, it's just um, I, I calculate outputs from OM and BV in one set of settings. I slightly adjust one of them. I take the difference between the two and then I plot it. And then this, you know, really, really very interesting things come come out. Um, so the plan, uh, so I did submit something on my own to that same call for the total eclipse. And the plan is to update OMS to work for the solar magnetic fields as well as for the Earth. And then do the same type of thing I've already done for the Earth, but create electrodynamics maps uh, for the sun for a variety of solar conditions, including the eclipse sun, uh, and then produce a whole series of artwork so that the public can better understand the sun. So it's got both science and art, you know, so both groups can better understand what's going on in our in our field. Um, so that's still in progress. That's under review. Um, I do plan to be submitting this uh, this work for uh, to a journal. It's currently with my co-authors. But since the summer school and all of that, I further extended the work um, to you know demonstrate because it's a pretty fundamental advance. So some skepticism may be warranted because the current state of the art is that you cannot produce orthogonal vectors. Things have to be you know non-orthogonal. Um, so to support like the electric field scaling functionality of OMMVV, I did a comparison against what I found for the Earth. Um, but there were no um, standards or references that I could go to to see exactly what the electric field distribution was along a magnetic field line. So I had to create my own model. Um, and that's just very simply presented over here. So on the top left, the <laughs> you see this kind of triangular shape. This is in computer memory space here. And this top of the, the lit triangle is like the upper field line. The bottom is the lower field line, and the stuff in between is the electric field that gets solved for. The picture on the top right uh, 
just to the right, that's the distribution in physical space. So you can see the field line distribution and the, the gradient and potential or the variation and potential. And then I compare my um, electric field from the model versus what OMF would, would predict. And both are, are close within you know, less than a percent over here. So I think that's really quite good. And then um, from the basis vectors, I also created an orthogonal coordinate system. So we also didn't have one of these where the coordinate system actually reflected the electrodynamics properties of the magnetic field. Um, so these are a sequence of plots to try to describe the structure, which can be a little bit complicated. But if I just start with this top right, the Earth is here, and it's between you know about six six million meters here, minus six million up to six million. So this is the Earth. This bottom boundary here, this is near the Earth's magnetic equator. And then this surface is how electric fields go from the high latitude electric field lines all the way down to the ground of the Earth. So these things follow electric field lines. Uh, and the other parameters are based on the structure of the magnetic field. So these are a few um, um, properties of that. So one of the things that I found was quite surprising for this zonal vector. So it's a vector that's produced that's um, like about the east and west direction, but it's like a magnetic east and west, right? It varies in relation to the magnetic field. It turns out if you just pick any place in space or on the earth and you follow that zonal vector around, you're going to end up right back to where you started. So you can actually use these vectors to circumnavigate the world. I kind of feel like I've, I've made a, an actual civilization achievement like the game, you know, because um, <laughs> uh, you can actually, it's people have been using the magnetic field to, you know, to do such a thing for a while, but that's actually using the direction. And, and what I'm doing is these derived vectors. Um, so it's really quite, uh, I find quite interesting. So I can use these types of properties just by following the zonal vector and there's the other, other vectors I follow to actually create this full coordinate system um, that's orthogonal and it's like magnetic longitude uh, and apex height. Uh, this differs in the typical magnetic longitude because I defined zero longitude to be uh, equal to zero geographic longitude. Uh, <laughs> So it makes it a little bit simpler and um, it's not quite the same values you go around the earth, but it's plus or minus a degree or so. So uh, hopefully, I don't know if that's going to be more or less confusing. Um, but so this is a pretty significant advance that I've built on top of the vectors and the vectors were able to support all this, which was really quite surprising, right? How often are you, are you right even moving into a new area? Uh, and then even more fundamentally, I've uh, been able to re-express the equations for electrodynamics using this basis and coordinate system um, to actually develop a new form. Um, so this is actually really quite fundamental, right? So this is the fundamental equation uh, equations for our field. Um, the differences here, so I know this is somewhat complicated, but this is a partial differential equation for the potential distribution around the globe. Uh, and I'm not going to go into all the terms here, but I'll just say there are fewer terms than there used to be because it's now orthogonal, so that makes it easier. Um, and then I've also been able to, um, previous derivations required that certain parameters be the same along a field line, which actually wasn't quite consistent with physics. So um, this equation varies with those, but there's this parameter here, these 1 over Ds that allow you to pick out a particular place along those field lines to do these calculations. So what that means is, I can do stuff like this. <laughs> so it's these type of things that actually enable the coordinate system that, I, that I've generated. So, um, so in this case, rather than, you know, we have some scientific result that already exists in the world and the open source community is implementing that one. You know, this was all started in the software and from the software now it's actually generated, in my opinion, you know, a, a significant a fundamental advance for space science. So uh, this is all written up and with my co-authors and, um, Hopefully it'll, it'll be submitted to your journal here uh, quite soon. So, um, so that's the OM thing that's continuing. I also had uh, uh, sent out to the list the thing about the project hooks about coupling different projects together so we could be, um, you know, a bit more unified in some ways where people can do their own thing via project, but then you know make it very easy to move to another one and and just get a, a larger meta feature set if that's the right word. Um, so the, the funding that I was trying to go after for this was coming from the NSF, um, which unfortunately imposes a number of additional requirements on personnel and institutions. Every agency has its own quirks and things like that, of course, uh, but the NSF excludes unaffiliated individuals like me or people that work for NASA or other government agencies. I'm not sure why. Um, 
but it, it makes it harder because <laughs> most of the people I actually typically work with with for PiSet are civil servants. So kind of um, the PiSet team is excluded from all of these kind of just off the bat, uh, which is really quite unfortunate. Um, and I've tried creating a multi-pass system to submit to the NSF, but it's just really not working out so far. So that's why this project took. Oh, Rebecca, I'm sorry, you have your hand up. I just noticed. Um, yeah, um, if you don't mind, uh, if you back up a slide. So you're saying you have these equations in a new coordinate system. So in what type of equation? Was this diffusion? No, this is the electrodynamics. So it's... Um, okay. Um, the distribution of potential that's um, so you right you have the neutral one that flows against the magnetic field, which creates the dynamo and then you have the whole um, plasma density redistribution and stuff like that so it's the it's also the distribution of charge electric fields current and things like that for an applied uh, neutral wind distribution. Okay, so are you thinking about making a new model based on this in this coordinate system. Uh, yeah, I hope so. If there is a suitable funding opportunity to to do that, but absolutely, yeah. I think there's and a I, roses one. Oh no, well, that would be great. Um, when I last checked recently, I, most of them it seemed weren't being called for this year, but um, maybe I hope there's I'm wrong. There might have been one on um, fundamental heliophysics. I'd have to look mm -hmm. it up again, but it's worth looking. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. That would be interesting. Yeah, I really like, I didn't get into it, but I was, I've already done like a um, a model without plasma, just so I could see kind of like what the electrostatic distribution would be. And that actually is turning out really quite well. Um, so yeah, I'd be really interested to see what a full model is. And I, I'm glad you brought that up because that's definitely something I want to do. So yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, thanks. I'll look, I'll look for that fundamental heliophysics thing, see if we can, I can find a way. All right. Okay, uh, so yeah, my, my attempts to try to get some path to the NSF and, and other folks in, in PySat or just other folks in the community uh, just hadn't quite worked out. So for the folks that expressed interest about participating and then I, I disappeared, I, I tried, it just didn't work out. So I'm letting you know. <laughs> uh, so, um, so if we want to solve some of these issues that matter to people and agencies that are not the NSF, um, we require some more NSF funding. I know we already have some in, in, in um, here in NASA with the HTM and HDE uh, programs, though I don't think HDEE -E is going this year. But, um, you know, it's kind of an issue of a squeaky wheel can get the grease. So there's actually an opportunity right now from, from NASA to talk about budget stuff. And I don't know how effective these things are, but there is a thing you can go and um, upvote particular comments about, hey, maybe open source can use some more funds. You can put in your own comment either way. I uh, just wanted to let the community know that that thing exists and it, it might help. I have no idea, but it's it's, it's there. Okay, so uh, moving on to a, an old slash new project. So this is, I just submitted something on PySat CDF on Friday. Uh, to the HDM call. Um, and one of the conditions of the uh, heliophysics tools and methods call is that we is that new proposals don't duplicate previous efforts. Um, and I've seen the notion of duplication in, in the field a few times, so I, I just thought I'd talk about it here. Um, while I know it seems cost effective, perhaps on a on a government funding side, you know, you have less, you only got so much money, you've got all the different things that you want to do. Might not want to use the same, you know, a limited selection of funds to do the same thing twice. Um, but I'll just point out that's doing something multiple times is the most common market outcome. So, um, and it's not just because of uh, um, necessarily market for, I mean, uh, business things, it can actually reflect the market. So just as a, a very you know big example, you have Mac OS, Windows, Linux, and Unix, they're all different operating systems. In principle, everybody could just be, you know, use one, right? They do all the same things as the other ones, uh, except you would find you would have a lot of very unhappy people if you made Windows people use Mac or Mac people use Windows or those folks use Linux or anything like that. Uh, and the reason being is those, all those different user groups have different needs, different modes of operating with computers and things like that. And whether or not it's just inertia, um, there's already a whole you know network of systems and things like that. And those 
um, different operating systems do approach the same type of feature set in different ways. They express them in different ways, all kinds of things like that. So on the surface, yeah, they're, they're all operating systems. They're all effective. Um, but there are very good reasons why users may select, select one of those operating systems over the other, right? And if we didn't have a variety, <clears throat> it would actually be worse off for the field of computers in general and for users. So, um, so if we didn't, if we have like a hard line against anything, having some duplication and functionality, there can be an ongoing user cost that's paid and that users may not be as well served by the package as, as maybe a different package could. Um, and then that's an ongoing cost. So um, cost of time and things like that. So uh, I've submitted a proposal to update and upgrade PyCD, PySAT CDF to the latest community standards and include support for multi-dimensional data. Um, by PySAT CDF, I'm talking about functionality to read common data format files from NASA, right? Which is a NASA package. Um, there are some existing packages in the community for CDF, and PySAT CDF is, you know, is one of them. It's been around since, what, like 2016? Um, no. So um, that's just kind of it. Uh, so that's the PySAT CDF thing. So that's the, the idea. That's, I'm, I'm working to serve a, a group that's not quite getting served by the, some of the existing things. Uh, new proposal or proposal to come um, is for orbit propagators. So the, the overall plan is to make a consistent Python interface to a variety of orbit propagators or a Pythagator, if you will. Uh, that's that's come for back, which I actually kind of like. Uh, it's fun. Uh, so a what? <laughs> so what's an orbit propagator? So if you've got a satellite out there, you may know where it is now, uh, but uh, typically, typically you need to know where it's gonna be in the future, right? Um, one practical thing is to communicate with the satellite, you need some ground-based hardware, uh, you know, usually some sizable satellite dish. Um, you have to schedule time with that satellite dish uh, to, you know, be ready and waiting for the satellite to come by. And you need to know when the satellite is going to come by and where to point the dish, right? When, when it's going to come by and where. Um, and that can actually be quite hard, right? The um, atmosphere is complicated and dynamic, <laughs> and there's always uncertainties and measurements. So those things can all, you know, couple together that um, one orbit, you'd be like, the satellite comes overhead exactly where it should be, you're like, wonderful, I know what's going on. And then the next orbit you look and it's not where it should be, you know, maybe something changed, density, neutral densities went up, it slowed down or whatever, things happen. Uh, and then once you lose track of your satellite, now you <laughs> you can't communicate with it to get your data down, all kinds of other stuff. So there's all kinds of just operational concerns for knowing where satellites are that then you know feed down into what kind of science you can actually achieve. Uh, so the government's got some software from the DoD um, where they you know predict all these things and they've kept that close to their chest. Right? That software is not generally available. I don't think I can get it at all. Um, so the community, open source community, responded because there are people that are just interested in satellites and things like that. So they created their own software to kind of re-implement what the government does. Uh, the community did not have access to the software to do that, but the satellite locations are published by the government. I believe it's NORAD. Um, so you can go to you know NORAD, um, and they got a whole table of all the different satellites and what they call two-line elements. So these two-line elements are just a grouping of numbers that describes the satellite orbit in ways that then the software uses to guesstimate where the satellite's going to be in the future. So they have all these outputs that are out there and the community used the outputs versus the outputs of their own software and kept tweaking the software until it basically matched what the government came out with. Um, so that open source implementation is called SGP4. The four relates to you know, a certain number of perturbation elements or something like that. Technically, you can have a different number there for the same software. Um, but the government settled on four elements, so that's what the open source community is using as well. Uh, there can be some challenges with the system. One, right, SGP4 is just the best guess or best effort at doing what the government did, which is, um, and it's good. Um, it seems very consistent with what the government did or does. <laughs> uh, but that government software was produced back in the day, you know, back in the day. Um, so, of course, there were very talented programmers back then. Maybe, you know, you even had to be more, perhaps more creative at times back then because you just didn't have the same number of CPU cycles and memory restrictions were much more significant. Uh, I mean, I believe the, the memory on Apollo was like hound wine, 
<laughs> hand wound memory cores, right? So that kind of stuff doesn't doesn't scale. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying that there's not capabilities in, in the older software, but it's just the simple fact that cap computers are just have a lot more capabilities now. So even you know, software written with the best type of tricks. Um, back in the day, you're going to have to give up on on some some physics and and some accuracy and detail to get the software to actually run in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so it could be good to not because um, like right now, PySat missions, which provides access to satellite propagation and things like that, um, that uses on the back end SGP4 as do a variety of open source uh, packages. Uh, similarly with Komodo, Komodo's got some orbit propagation and, you know, uh, uh, interpolation, other functionality. In the backside there, too, they're using SGP4. Um, that's the common solution because it's the software out there, but it may not be the best one. So the, the idea is that we could um, make a consistent Python interface to a variety of orbit propagators. There are some other uh, implementations of, of these propagators out there in the community. Um, but right now, if you want to use those different ones, right, you're going to have to go out and find the software on your own. Each of them has its own kind of API and other interface. Um, they're all, you know, kind of got their own unique API. So if you want to switch from one to the other, that takes additional work on the side of the developer. So what we're thinking we could do is we could collect some of the existing propagators that are already, already exist in the community um, and then put it behind a single consistent interface. So then... Um, when users come along for, say, PySat missions or in Komodo, if they wanted to use a different propagator, right, then they could just um, provide the right keyword or, you know, hit the right flag within this, those, that software to um, engage those different things. Uh, and, of course, not just for those, those packages. It would be an independent um, package um, so that anybody could come along and, and, you know, benefit from the same things. Um, and also, you know, helps minimize requirements on other other packages like PySat missions and Komodo and things like that. If the orbit propagators in its own own package, uh, so so that's the general idea. Is we want to be able to increase our accuracy with satellite operations and things like that, um, which then will flow down to uh, to science. So normally, all those operations are handled, you know, by paid members of NASA and some other. I mean, there's some commercial entities and things like that now. But there's ground operations teams and, and they kind of do their thing. But I would like to have be able to get to a, a part where we have a full stack uh, available in the open source community so we can, you know, in principle, at least um, have, have the software to be able to manage those type of things on our own. Um, that would not, not only help that community, but help us as scientists, uh, I believe, as well. Um, Typically, if you're writing a proposal for a mission, one of the first things NASA is going to say is, you know, prove to me that your, your mission is, is going to solve the science. Uh, and then so one of the first things you have to do is you're going to have to propose an orbit, at least to yourself or to your team, uh, propagate that thing forward in time, right? See where the satellite is, what kind of decay is going to be, all kinds of stuff like that. So um, by making these tools available to the open source community, it can help the diversity and the types of uh, the, the teams and stuff that actually submit. Because um, there is software out there um, to do that, but some of it's or a good of it, amount of it's commercial and, and not particularly cheap, right? Because it was serving defense industries and other groups that had money. Uh, but by getting it uh, in open source, then we can help remove some of that stuff. So that's the general notion is to make a different variety, a variety of these tools available from a single interface. So then it's just easier to work with for everybody involved. All right. So um, thank you very much for the time. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments or, or discussion, I'd be happy to engage. All right, thank you. Thanks, Bertha. Mm -hmm. Any questions, comments, thoughts um, for Russell? I'm gonna interject a comment before someone gets anything too meaty and just say that's wonderful and PyHD needs more consistent interfaces like this. Awesome. Thank you. And maybe Rebecca should name more things if she came up with Pythag Pythagator. <laughs> right? I'm typically <laughs> bad at naming things, but that one came out decently well. But I see Bobby has a link to something in the chat. Could you explain that link, Bobby? Oh, it's just another orbit propagator that's out there already. Um, so what's your opinion of that one? I haven't used it. <laughs> <laughs> Doing random stuff, okay. 
Yeah, I mean, the, um, the SSC that contains all the orbits of all the heliophysics missions and a bunch of others, too, we get the data directly from the missions or from the two line orbit elements or the or various other schemes of places as well. So. so you said two line elements, so that requires a propagator. Um, what does SSC use? Um, we've got a regular NORAD account. We use their software. Interesting. So maybe there's a way to actually include that access to through a NORAD account. That uh, no, um, no, no. I mean, <laughs> it, we, it's restricted. So we we have to be careful how we you know we we can't put out data. Um, the defense spacecraft we can only do you know historical. And uh, I mean, there's various constraints on it. I mean, we have a special account with them. So, hmm. but the the data that we do have is is public. So, I mean, that we we make public. So, um. okay. Um, the question I have, I don't know if the right software people are here, but are there already um, propagators in other packages? Like Pi Speedus or um, maybe SunPi, I'm not sure. I don't know why you would want something like that in SunPi. I was like just it's, asking. <laughs> yeah, it's too like it's it's specialized enough that it should be its own package. Oh yeah. I know that orbits is a keyword that we use for features in Pi HD packages, but propagators i know is not one that's that's the most i can give on the topic okay is anyone here from pi speed s it looks like not okay and that's worth asking now but i know there's a movement you know with all this um open source software push from various agencies i know there are several commercial companies that are looking at open sourcing their propagators. Um, so that would be a nice place to start. Try and get some of that into PyHC, possibly through this package. I mean, I think most people use the commercial um, that satellite toolkit, I guess, that for mission planning. Um... Yeah, I think, I think that's fairly standard. There's also the, the GMAT um, toolkit that Goddard is distributing as an open source package. Um, there's also um, Geodyne, mm -hmm. which is a one that takes into account actual at, more atmospheric drag, right? Because if you're just doing an SGP or TLE propagator, it sort of assumes that your atmospheric drag is constant. And I've been I've been watching a lot of satellites decay lately, and it is interesting that you can get very, um, I guess, lengthy. So like I was watching one of the uh, Nutsat, one of the CubeSats, and they had sort of predicted that last Saturday it was going to reach 200 kilometers, and last Saturday it, the orbit decayed. So it, it pulls it in much more quickly, because when you're decaying, you have much more atmospheric drag that the SGB4 doesn't take into account. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So... Um... One of the one of the uh, scientists at CCMC actually mentored a postdoc. Um, no, he was a master student at the time. This is Zach Waldron, and um, he collaborated with the Komodo team to get physics-based model model outputs of neutral density in to geodyne, and now it's pi geodyne um, because of his work. But then he was able to compare the um, propagated orbit accurate accuracies for a given um, satellite trajectory based on the results from different model inputs of what that neutral density actually is instead of the standard empirical one. And his results are quite interesting. Um, he's trying to get the paper out, <laughs> but one of the um, kind of hidden purposes, I guess, of Pythagator is if we can create a standard inter interface on the top of these, um, and open source them, then the community then has access to get in behind it and replace the uh, empirical model 
of what the neutral density is with physics-based models, and then they can finally do validation studies of what neutral density is with modeling. Um, so that would be an interesting application, but the, the software isn't ready for that yet. So that's part of the goal of this Pythagator idea is to prepare the way for that kind of validation study. So Bobby, what were the names of those? Um, geez, I missed, no, it wasn't Bobby, Jeff. Jeff, you said one of the, NASA was putting out a standard one. What was the name of it? There's a tool called GMAT. Um, I think actually, um, Jonathan Smith has been playing with that recently. I think it is basically a MATLAB binary compiled kind of tool, mm -hmm. but it uses like EMSYS and um, the Jackie Roberts models and things like that for neutral density. So it's, okay. it's basically very similar to my understanding is very similar to something like STK where it's a very uh, GUI driven environment. Uh, and I'm, there's I'm, a Helio one interface to that as well. Okay. Uh, it's, I think it's just the acronym is like Generalized Mission Analysis Toolkit. Okay. What was the other one you said? Um, STK, which is a software toolkit. It's a commercial property or a commercial product, and that's, I think, kind of the stand. I think that's what we had been using for propagation for some of these missions. I think that's what some of the universities are using as well. Um, so basically both of those kind of pull in a realistic neutral model that something like SGP4 wouldn't have. So, right. you know, it, and realistic, I mean something like EMSIS, right? So it, it recognizes that neutral density increases as you decrease in altitude. Yeah, the, the, the paper that Zach is coming out with um, actually found that some of the physics-based models were performing better than MSIS um, 2.0. It was, yeah. I, I won't give it, I won't give away more than that. It's his paper. <laughs> but I thought it was really interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, he has some things he has to work out in the paper, but it's, it's pretty close. And I, I think, I, I think the, um, People interested in propagators will be interested in it, and it hopefully will motivate more of this kind of work. Darren, you're really silent, silent on the Komodo side. <laughs> so I guess I should say this. So I'm no longer part of the Komodo team. Darren is now the official lead for that. I am now attending um, from my position at the uh, Goddard Space Flight Center Center, Center for Helio Analytics. And um, so. CFA? I mean, you got a new position, oh. Rebecca? Because this is the yes, first I did. You okay. Cool. I started today. Oh, nice. sorry to say what it is again? Um, I'm a co investigator at the Center for Helio Analytics which has a task given to it by head, NASA headquarters for open science. Sweet. I'm glad that resolved quickly. Yep. Awesome. Well, any other thoughts, comments, anything related to today? Yeah, I wanted to like come back to the uh, points that Russell is making about duplication, since um, if there's not enough duplication, then that leads to stagnation. Um, if there's too much duplication, then that can also lead to a bad user experience. So like for the Python packaging software, um, there are things like um, poetry, flit, hatch, and a whole bunch of other things. And for newcomers, it's like hard to know where to start. Um, so having, so yeah, it is, um, something that we do have to balance. That makes sense. Cool. Um, anything else or any other thoughts, comments, um, anything anyone wants to bring up for future telecom or the spring meeting? 
Oh, I also um, posted in the uh, chat that PyCon is coming up uh, this month, this month, um, in a few weeks, and I'll be going. Um, and then also the SciPy meeting is happening in July. And I found that to be a really good meeting back in the time before global COVID pandemics. Um, and it's probably still really good. Austin in July is a little hot, but <laughs> besides that, I highly recommend the meeting. Yeah, um, I know SciPy is planning on having a presence at the SciPy meeting. So Will Barnes submitted a paper. So, um, and they, they've been before and they agree with you, Nick, it's a really, it's a really great meeting to see the wider scientific community out there using Python. So I think it would be really useful for someone from or people from PyHC in general to go. Noted. I'm I'm going to try and go. So I want to see what's going on. I'll be going to PyCon, but not um, sci-fi this year. I don't know if Sampai has any um, plans for PyCon. Well, if we don't have any other uh, thoughts, topics, concerns, anything, <laughs> we can go ahead and wrap up early. Well, thanks everyone for showing up. Um, see you again in two weeks, same time, same place. Uh, topic TBD, I'll send it out in an email, not the day of this time, so. <laughs> Sounds good. For what it's worth, oh, okay. Um, I started uploading PyHC telecons to YouTube. Um, so be sure to start checking our YouTube for all of that. I will still keep a hard copy um, in my local, you know, last funded space, but I figured it might be easier to just view it from, you know, a central source. Yeah. See y'all. Yeah.